Let's uh, talk now about how to uh, run a regular discipleship meeting. Whether you have one or two people with you, or whether you have 12 or more, um, whatever number it looks like, these are uh, my recommendations. And again, this is an experiential comment, not a Bible verse. So this is what I've found works. If the Big Ten is our toolbox, and if the targets in our discipleship is to expand vision for the, the doctrine, the teaching on discipling biblically, and if the, if the goal is that multiplication be embedded as a core minimum, and if uh, the Big Ten is our toolbox of sustainable, reproducible habits, then what does that look like when you're actually meeting with somebody? As we've said, the problem is not in the what or in the why, the problem or I should say the uh, disagreements, or that's, that's maybe too strong a word, the place where there's uh, uh, much room for variety, <laughs> that's a positive way to say it, is in, the, is in the how. What does it look like? So, you know, people sit on the edge of their seat, they realize, whoa, I want that. Uh, I want to be that kind of guy or gal who reproduces and multiplies and then but, but, but what do I do is the question. How do I do it? And uh, this would be our how in terms, in terms of a meeting. I, uh, people say to me sometimes, what do you do when you finish the Big Ten? And the, the point is we never finish the Big Ten. The Big Ten's like blocking and tackling or dribbling a basketball or working on fielding drills or base running or uh, dribbling in soccer. Those are all sport metaphors. It would be working on sales techniques, or if you're a speaker, uh, trying to be better and studying it. There's certain things that you, a singer, always working on uh, her scales, or the uh, same with a piano player. Whatever it is, there are certain building blocks that are part of whatever you're trying to be good at, whatever you're trying to gain competence or expertise. And so uh, I remember one time with Dr. Coleman, I asked him, uh, you know, what was, this is after I'd known him for a while and I was physically with him, which happens rarely. Uh, you know, now it happens, thankfully, every year. Uh, previously, it happened every few years. And I saw him one time and I, thought, I, I felt to ask him, uh, just what would, what's kind of the secrets? What would be one thing you'd say to me? What would be critical? I can't remember how I framed it, but I was looking for some maybe key insight that would be striking and provocative. I mean, I thought I felt like I knew where he'd go, but, but I, you never know when you're going to hear something that might be a little bit different. So I asked him, and he pondered a few seconds, and, you know, again, the question was something like, what would be critical? What would be mandatory? And he said, well, I, I think you should pray, you know, and I had my notepad out, or my mind was thinking, all right, I didn't write that down because I, I thought, okay, I, I got that, pray, I know that's a big deal. And then he said, uh, you need to be focused on the Word of God, and then I, you know, I'm, I'm still waiting there, and then he said, that's about it, and it struck me, uh, and I, my first reaction was surprise, and then it wasn't surprise, because the blocking and tackling of Christianity is going to evolve around the Word of God and prayer, and it's going to be our vertical relationship, being precedes doing, and so the Holy Spirit is in us, and he in, in live it, he focuses on Jesus, the Word of God, and our conversation with God and his conversation with us uh, through the Word of God, and th this is the guts. Uh, and I've mentioned previously how the Big Ten took shape, and so in a regular meeting, uh, we just had our meeting this morning, our men's group, and I, I articulated these same things, because we're finishing a season of the group, and... I was trying to say to him, here's, here's again a how. You've been in the group for months, some guys, years. You've been in the group. Let me reiterate uh, the what, why, and how of what it looks like to meet regularly in an intentional, strategic way. And uh, we always pray. Praying has two facets we've talked about. It's tacos, the different kinds of prayer, and practicing them. And then it's long praying. So we always, we always pray. We always read a passage of scripture that's usually a passage I draw out of the reading that was done this last week, the homework assignment of two or three chapters a day. And we always read together and we 
all, I say always, but I mean most every time we ask them to repeat their Bible verse that they memorized or to come up, uh, sometimes I'll just say, pick a verse that you want to memorize this week, but memorize something, be ready to share. And so we always pray, we always read, we always memorize scripture. There's three of the first three of the Big Ten are always going to happen virtually every week because you can't get that down too much. Uh, the fourth one is Bible song. And frankly, we learned that in the first couple weeks when we first start meeting. It's more organic when you add people to your group over time. When new ones add, you may need to revisit that issue because as I've mentioned before, we don't just have a start and then we don't add at all. We start and we add as we go. So I have people coming into the group or cycling out of the group for a variety of reasons, job change, uh, life situations change, they move. Happens all the time when you have a larger group. It's less when you have a smaller group because there's less people that would move about. But we, we uh, sing the Bible song together. I've sang it uh, in a previous uh, clip and uh, we give them the lyrics to it. We sing it with them. You know, I do it. I do it. They watch. They do it. I watch. They do it. That all plays out in, in the regular, for me, weekly meetings. You don't have to meet weekly. Most people do. Some people meet uh, a couple, every other week. But, you know, if you miss one week and you meet every other week, that's once a month. And that's uh, not sustainable. That's not a sustainable rub, in my opinion. That's not a quantity of meeting time over uh, a quantity of time. And so... Uh, we try to meet every week, and the Bible song would be something we would do early, and then we just circle back on it occasionally just to refresh it. Uh, learning how to use a study Bible is something that I would recommend doing early in the stage of your discipleship process because the faster you can get them to learn to use a study Bible, the faster you can start giving them assignments to study stuff, to answer questions that they have to teach us as a group. So somebody will say, tell me about predestination. And I'll say, you study it. Here's a few starter verses. You take them, you study it, you come back next week and give us a five-minute teaching on the doctrine of predestination. And frankly, all of the time, they come back when they, when they build a verse pool uh, of verses appropriate to the question or the issue or the teaching, the doctrine that they want to study they do an absolutely competent job, even if they're a baby believer. Those, the tool of, of, the, uh, of a study Bible, and it was reiterated today uh, that uh, the NIV study Bible, not of the recent editions, unfortunately, but the editions in the late and early 90s are the best study Bibles I've seen if you want to learn how to use the cross-reference system and build pools of verses. We'll talk about that more thoroughly when we go through the Big Ten here uh, soon. So how to use a study Bible is something we do once and then they know how to feed themselves and feed others and teach others how to feed others. Uh, the, f the sixth thing is the five questions. We usually don't get to them right away. Uh, they're something, when I say not right away, I just mean the first month. We may not get to that when they're uh, praying about and taking action steps regarding evangelism and regarding discipleship and their own, shall we say, mentoring or discipled by, uh, being discipled by someone else. So the five questions, they're going to be incorporated in. Once we incorporate them, uh, we'll regularly visit there. There have been sequences where every week we go over some aspect of the five questions because I want to know what's happening with their disciple prospects and their disciples, and they keep track by logging. We'll go over that when we go over the Big Ten. By logging the people they're praying for, to either for the faith, coming to the faith, evangelism, or to disciple or to seek his future mentors. So the five questions is regularly dealt with. It's a fundamental deal that we circle back to all the time because I want them always working with their disciples, other disciples, praying for people to convert and pursuing uh, becoming lifelong learners by meeting with other people who can mentor them. Uh, the, given the testimony is something that happens very soon. Uh, we start that early on and, and I give my testimony. I show them it written out. I have them write it out. We work it down over a period of weeks to some bullet points, and then somebody shares each week in a large group, and in a small group, they'd share the next week their testimony, and then we'd refine it and ask questions about it, get them to clarify some points. The accountability begins immediately, accountability in terms of putting people in groups where they can keep in touch with each other regularly through text generally, and uh, so they'll know to try to text each other every day or other day. Generally, if you have a large enough group, they're doing that. Somebody's doing it daily, which triggers somebody to respond to that. 
and that's a way to just keep it fluid and keep them thinking about their homework assignment, thinking about their priorities, thinking about their regularity. Uh, so that happens very, very early. Dealing with the accountability questions is kind of a second stage deal that might come about the second month that you're meeting. And then the gospel of the presentation, the gospel indif- indi- uh, invitation is dependent upon them memorizing Akprogro, which again, if you're memorizing two verses a week, that would be done in five weeks. So in the second month of meaning, they should have memorized Akprogro, which then allows them to move on memorizing other scriptures and allows them then to work on uh, homework and then their role playing in the group and then homework assignments backdoor outside the group their uh, gospel presentation and gospel invitation. The point is this, on any given meeting, if you counted them one through ten, prayer, Bible reading, Bible memory, Bible song, Bible study, five questions, testimony, accountability, gospel presentation, gospel invitation, that we're always going to have the prayer and Bible reading, Bible memory. That's always going to happen. So you're going to do one, two, three, four, one week. And then it's one, two, three, four, six. And then it's one, two, three, five, six. And then it's one, two, three, five, seven. And then it's one, if that makes sense. That you're going to fill up your, we meet for 90 minutes. You're going to fill up your 45 minutes or hour or hour and a half. You're going to fill it up with some announcements and logistics. We're meeting next week. Here's what's going on. We're going to have a retreat coming up. Whatever it is you have as announcements and logistics. And then you're, we always start off by praying. And then the next thing we do is read. And at that point, we do something else of the Big Ten. At some point, I just do some announcements or logistics. I'll ask for comments from the group. Again, I'm, I'm meeting with a group of 10 or 20 all the time. Your group may be, you know, two or four or whatever, seven. So it may be smaller. Obviously, the longer you disciple... And the longer you stay in an area of continuity, the greater chance that you're going to have larger numbers in your group, which is cool. You want a big family. I mean, uh, the people that I know that have kids, if they can afford it in the natural, uh, they want kids. And the more kids, the merrier. And that's certainly true in discipleship. Because if you have one, you might as well have two. If you have two, you might as well have four. And there's all kinds of people out there that are orphans. Remember, we've talked about that. Orphans meaning they are converted but they've never themselves been discipled. Nobody's ever walked with them in an intentional, strategic way to develop a toolbox of habits that are sustainable and reproducible. And thus, even though they may have walked with God for five or 20 years, they want to come into a community where they have disciplines and habits. This is true with men. It's also true with women. Uh, I run into guys all the time that have been in the faith a long time but really don't pray They really don't read regularly. They don't memorize scripture. They don't know their way around the scriptures. The Bible song can help with that. They don't know how to use a study Bible. They've never really regularly shared and feel comfortable sharing their testimony. They're not in accountability relationships in a practical way. And they don't have a plan to present the gospel or invite somebody in the kingdom. They've been in the church. They've been in the local orphanage for years and decades. And they have no habits and no plan to develop them. Because they've never pondered it or it wasn't made clear enough or some, whatever. Most people have not been discipled biblically, thus they don't disciple biblically. Again, that would qualify as ignorance and then it becomes unbelief if they don't think they need to get that serious about it, though the issue is obedience or dis, uh, disobedience, or they're afraid to do it because no, nobody's walking with them, nobody's showing them the way so they hear about it, but they don't know what to do and that that fear stops them, or again, the last one that we talk about is the cost, uh, just the uh, exercising your will to committing to it is costly, because you, when you say yes to that, you got to say no to something else, because there's only so much time, and you got to de- decide when you're going to invest your time, so in my regular meetings, we do the Big Ten over and over, if I met five years, and if I was in an area, we would have multiple years of meeting. And the group would change over time. It'd change regularly. But that's all we do. People always say, what do you do when you finish? You don't finish blocking and tackling. Because you always have to stay sharp at the things that are fundamental. Prayer and the Word of God is fundamental. Bible memory is really Bible work. The Bible song is Bible work. 
And learning to use a study Bible is Bible work. Five questions of evangelism and discipleship are about biblical doctrinal work. Sharing your testimony is biblical. Accountability is biblical when it's around things that are biblical. And presenting the gospel and inviting people into, rela in, people into relation with you is biblical. So here we are, focus on, focusing on biblical commandments, mandated behaviors, right? Uh, you want the heart, you don't just want the behavior. But as you walk with people and they develop vertically through the word of God and prayer, intimacy with God, then their response or the byproduct is that they do the works of the kingdom. Being precedes doing. But they both have to exist simultaneously, and they do in a supernatural way. So that's a weekly meeting. I might teach a little bit. I might, but I don't, we don't spend, when I say teach, that means I'll interject points or something will happen during the week or with one of the guys that I want to throw out there. So we use these experiences and opportunities as educational moments. But the goal in discipleship is not to meet. The goal in discipleship is to, is to do the works of the kingdom, to evangelize and disciple. It's the Great Commission lifestyle. So we come together not to come together. We come together to go out. When I verbalize that, I say we come together to go out. It's about going out. It's always about going out. But we come together for inspiration. We come together for education. We come together to practice, to role play, to develop, for me to be able to monitor and for there to be accountability. This is what we do in the weekly meeting. But the ministry is done out there in their circles, their neighborhood, their school circles, their historical circles, their work circles, their community circles, their hobby circles. The work of the kingdom is outside the meeting, but we come together like Jesus pulled them together to educate them and debrief them, and, and they moved from education to more ministerial roles. They were sent out after a while in two by two, 12 of them, 70 of them, and then he left the planet, gave them the Holy Spirit power, had showed them what to do, had told them what to do. They'd done it with him. He'd sent them out to do it, and, and reevaluated, debriefed with them, and then he worked himself out of a job, which is our job. So your job is to work yourself out of a job. That's your job as a physical parent. That's your job as a spiritual parent. You have a window of time that you bring an impartation, and at that point, they go get them. Hopefully while you're still in the neighborhood, and even if you're not physically in the neighborhood, I told the guys today, listen, I'm, I'm a text away, I'm an email away, I'm a phone call away, I'm a Skype away, I'm a Marco Polo away. I can be a uncle or a previous spiritual father to you as long as we're alive if you wish. My commitment to you is to stay engaged in relationship. What you do in response to that is up to you. But if you need help and if you need somebody to help you reach your goals and if I can do that, I want to do that. That's the heart of discipleship. So this is an example of weekly meetings for me. We start out with the early stage stuff and we move to others as we go. And at that point, their toolbox gets filled and refined, and they add their own tools that they come across. Uh, we'll talk about other tools also, but we always revisit those primary fundamental uh, habits, tools, and spiritual disciplines.